Eric Sean of the South, we're keeping our hands sharp with the help of Case Knives, the sponsor of this episode. A tradition of my family for generations, my granddaddy used to say the best cure for idle hands was to build something. But in today's day and age, everything's done with a click, a swipe, or a tap. But how about we put away the screens and put your hands to work with a case knife? If you are listening to Sean of the South, I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich. And man, we got a great show lined up ahead of you here, coming to you live via the podcast airwaves and the radio waves all over this fine nation. These folks you see behind me here fixing to play music for you tonight are Geary and Uma Peters, everybody. Geary and Uma Peters. This portion of our program is brought to you by visitnorthalabama.org, the Mountain Lakes Tourist Association. Visit the 16 North Alabama counties and make this state what it is. The North Alabama Hallelujah Trail, for instance, features 32 churches that are at least 100 years old, standing on their original sites, still holding services, and are accessible to the public. Now, these are the portrait of North Alabama's history and tell the remarkable story of early Alabamans from the early days wide through 16 counties and the churches that you will see were the churches that were selected during an intensive two-year scientific research process which included testing the walls with specialized equipment to detect whether or not actual shouting had taken place inside. See the white painted timber frame church that is St. John's Episcopal Church in Tuscumbia built in 1855 or visit Mount Pleasant Methodist Church and see aged white wood and square nail and wood peg construction or visit my particular favorite Pine Torch Church, a tiny little primitive log cabin in Bankhead National Forest built from the poplar trees in 1850. Pine Torch Church still holds church service every Sunday at 10 a.m. Be there or be square. So visit the trail of churches and sit in a pew or two and remember your fundamentalist pioneers who taught you how to sing good songs, believe in things, and how to feel very guilty for dancing at wedding receptions. Whatever you do, you can do it better in North Alabama. So visit NorthAlabama.org or hashtag VisitNorthAL. And now let's have another tune here from Geary and Uma Peters, everybody. Geary and Uma Peters. Name 
I'm going to read you a little bit of our mail tonight, a little bit of our mail sent in to us this evening from people all over the nation, listeners who had nothing better to do than to put a pen to paper or tap out an email or, God forbid, use the phones to send us a few sentiments that they thought we ought to know or to try to sell us web services, even though they are in a foreign country. Our first message comes from Philip Chickery in Rogers, Arkansas. John, when I was a kid, my mother used to sit me down and we would listen to your hit parade. You probably don't remember that show because you're too young. No, there's no probably about it. You are too young to remember that show because I am almost too young to remember that show and I'm almost 80 years old. But I do remember hearing the Andrews sisters and Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby sing, Don't Fence Me In. Anyway, when I heard your show with the cowboy songs on it, it instantly reminded me of the show Your Hit Parade. And I was a kid again sitting in front of my grandmama's console radio, and we were listening to Gene Autry. The only thing is, this time, I'm an old man, but not a child. So thank you from an elderly guy who goes by the name Philip nowadays, but will always look in the mirror and think of himself as little Phil. Dear little Phil, thanks for the letter. Thanks for the letter. Paula Hudson, Okaloosa Island, Florida. While taking our annual trip to Belize last February, our friends from Biloxi, Mississippi introduced us to your blog and your show. I found your podcasts and I found it funny that I had to go all the way to Belize to find a storyteller musician that actually lives in our backyard. I think it was the first blog I read where you talked about a church on 331 in Freeport around Black Creek. Or then it was when I read your blog about Tallahassee. I've lived there for 29 years before moving back to my family's home on the island. Or this morning when I listened to your 75th podcast and identified not only with your uncertainty about what you did for a living, but your description of the hoity-toity dinner guests. I was raised by Yankees on the island, raised by Yankees, but married a good old Southern boy who also built houses and has spent my last 45 years learning Southern ways. Thank you for sharing your unlimited talents and making us laugh and cry at the same time. Just wanted to say keep up the great work, Paula. Emily Smith, Mobile, Alabama. Sean, you probably read this before, but these are advice, these are points of advice from farmers, and I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Well, number one, advice from a farmer. Your fences need to be horse high, pig tight, and bowl strong. That's a good one. Number two, keep skunks and bankers at a distance. Number three, life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Number four, a bumblebee is always considerably faster than a John Deere tractor. (laughs) Number five, words that soak into your ears are always whispered and not yelled. Number six, meanness don't just happen overnight. It takes a lot of time. Number seven, forgive your enemies. It messes with the heads. (laughs) Number eight, don't corner something that you know is a whole lot meaner than you are. (laughs) Number nine, it don't take a very big person to carry a grudge. Number 10, you cannot unsay a cruel word. Number 11, every path has a few puddles. Number 12, when you wallow with pigs, you get dirty. Number 13, the best sermons are lived, not preached. Unless you go, of course, to the Baptist church, in which case the best sermons are shoved down your throat. Number, what number am I on? Number, number, number what? <laughs> number 14. Number 14. 
Most of the stuff people worry about ain't never going to happen no how. Uh, that's an amen to that one. Number 15, don't judge folks by the crazy relatives. <laughs> Number 16, remember that silence is sometimes the very best answer. Number 17, live a good and honorable life. Then, when you get older, you can look back and enjoy it a second time. Number 18, don't interfere with something that ain't bothering you none. That's real good advice. Number 19, timing has a lot to do with the outcome of a rain dance. Hmm. Number 20, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you need to do is stop digging. And number 21, don't pick a fight with an old man because if he's too old to fight, he'll just shoot you dead. Good advice. James Inman Blackshear Joe. Dear Sean, being raised and growing up among those sweet southern women like we have, I'm sure you've heard that every diet plan in the world circulating out there, I'm sure you've heard of them. I thought I had too until the other night. My son Jamie and I both, reformed bachelors, had just sat down to supper when one of my daughters stopped by for a quick visit. I offered to fix her a plate. She said, no daddy, I'm on a 30 day fast. And I said, do what? Are you crazy? You're not gonna eat for a month? And then she goes on to tell me, oh no, 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 I eat. But my, my, that's when her brother, my son, cuts her off and takes the barbecue wing from his mouth and says, oh, so then you just half fasten it then. Sean, say that last word very fast and you'll get the idea. You're half fasting it. <laughs> so I don't know about her, but my diet's working pretty great because I laugh so hard I could hardly eat dinner. Yeah, my daughter doing a 30-day fast. I say, God bless them and pass the tater salad. Your buddy, James. Dear James, agreed. Pass that tater salad this away and keep those congealed salads as far away from me as you can. <laughs> Mike Fowler, Lafayette, Georgia. Dear Sean, a friend of mine that I teach with told me about your show and I'm steadily working my way through your catalog. Last Monday while finally mowing the lawn, I refused to mow in March. Things were going pretty great. I had finished the front yard in record time and was just starting on the backyard. My wife came screaming at the back door and it scared me so bad I almost came clean off the lawnmower. She said I had slung a rock through the window and it had almost hit her while she was folding laundry in the bedroom. And I was shocked because my wife rarely folds long. <laughs> this is the only excuse she'll probably need to never do that again. After I cleaned up the glass, my seven-year-old son looked at me with seven years of wisdom and said, Daddy, if I were you, I'd look for rocks before I go back to mowing. I was in no mood for his jokes. So I looked at him and I said, you know, I've seen you short arm through th few throws to home plate during ball games. If I were you, I'd get out there and throw some rocks to strengthen up my right arm. As if things could get any worse. The next day after, my, after work, my wife told me that the washing machine had died to the tune of $500 to fix it. Well, anyway, it's been a long, long week. Thought you might want to hear about it. Well, dear Mike, dear Mike, I can say I certainly hope your boy develops a good curveball. Jason Afram, Portland, Oregon. Sean, I'm far from home, very, very homesick. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm hoping for a job transfer that will bring me back south with my family, where we can be with family in Columbus, Georgia again. Oregon's a great state, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. But it's not home. It's not home when you wake up every day wishing that you could see home. And I wake up feeling that way and I go to bed feeling that way. I'm afraid I made a mistake by coming out here. I guess you do things for your family in order to make good money, but there ain't no amount of money that's worth feeling like you are not with your family at home. So I can't wait to see my mama. I can't wait to see my daddy or my sister, or my brother. 
And I can't believe I'm saying this, but even though I don't like my mother-in-law, I can't wait to see her either. So wish me well. Have your listeners wish me well during my time here in Oregon. And have them wish me well back home too when the time comes, because it can't come soon enough. Your listener, Jason. Well, dear Jason, dear Jason, I have heard it said that home is where the heart feels at ease, where people know your name and ask about your mom and them, and where you feel as though your soul will go back when your body dies to that place. I'm wishing for you to find home wherever you are, be it Oregon or Columbus, and I'm wishing for you to find the love that it brings, be it Oregon or Georgia. But more than anything, more than anything, I am wishing that your mother-in-law doesn't listen to this show. And that's letters from our listeners. And now let's have another tune here from Geary and Uma Peters, everybody. Geary and Uma Peters. It was a, a summer night, a summer night, when I went to go see a Little League game. Little League game, my cousin's son, he was playing Little League ball out in the little old field way out in the, way out in the sticks, dirt field. We just had a lot of rain. It was very humid. Crickets were, 
crickets were out. So were the yellow flies. So were the, the gnats. So were the snakes. And so were the other pieces of wildlife. This is West Florida. If the mosquitoes and the yellow flies don't get you, our snakes will. <laughs> Kids were out there on the field and they were running around. They were just playing the game of life. Baseball is just this microcosm of life. I love to watch kids play baseball. They shout at each other, they yell at each other. And when the game is over, when the game is over, all the parents on the stands, they watch their kids do what kids have been doing since the very beginning of time. The kids walk out onto the field, they have their gloves on their left hand and their right hands outsplayed. They form a single file line on the field and they all line up together and the opposing team does the same thing and these two lines cross in a parallel fashion. They just move side by side and these kids hold out their right hand and you can hear the slaps of their hands as they say, good game, good game, good game. It is tradition in Little League Baseball to greet every boy from the opposing team with the words, good game, good game, good game. The kids, I was watching, they were saying it with about the same sincerity that it would take you to scratch your hind parts. I mean, they, their hearts weren't in it. But the point was, they were saying it. They were saying it, and I was just proud to see that tradition going on. We never played a game in my childhood when we didn't finish with the good game ceremony. It was just part of it. It was just part of life. Baseball was part of my life. When I was a child, baseball was my life. In the summertime, it was all I ever thought about. I went to sleep thinking about it. When I woke up, I was thinking about it. I played catch out in the front lawn with my father whenever he'd get off work or with my buddies. Uh, we used to play baseball way out in this this abandoned spot of a field where the, the, the farmer behind us, he'd rotate his cows every year or so. And this field could be scalped by hand tools, by hand tools, and we just need a little air. And you would try to avoid the big old piles of cow fertilizer, natural, straight out of the, straight out of the cow. And we would run and we would play. We'd use old couch cushions for, for the bases. And we'd use an old piece of plywood embedded in the, in the earth for home plate. And if you came sliding across home and you weren't prepared, you'd get yourself a bunch of splinters. I've still got splinters in my upper thigh from at least 30 years ago. <laughs> but this is what we did. We played baseball. Wonderful fun. Wonderful fun. I love baseball. We would always play games. My father was our coach. He was our coach. My father took a very active role in baseball because baseball was his life. My father was a natural born athlete. Always was. He knew how to play the game. He knew how to teach the game. He knew how to have fun. We had a boy on our team, his name was, well, for the purposes of this thing, I'm going to call him Gary. But that's not his real name. Garrett was a good baseball player and a natural athlete. A natural athlete. This kid could hit anything. He could swat anything with a knife. I mean, he could swat anything with a bat, including some species of deer flies. He was the kind of kid who was tall and lean with a skinny neck. My mother said he was so skinny that his pants needed to be altered so that he only had one back pocket. <laughs> he was so skinny. That if it wasn't for his items, I would have no shape at all. <laughs> he was just a lean boy with blue eyes, piercing blue eyes, and blonde hair. And just, just as kind as you please. He was so interested in just baseball that he wasn't interested in any other kind of activity. And so I remember that game when my cousin Ed Lee brought some red man chewing tobacco to the field. <laughs> red man chewing tobacco. And he gathered up in the dugout, and I was sitting on the dugout. I, I wasn't a very good athlete. I never was a very good athlete. In fact, I was a terrible athlete. I was a chubby child with red hair and freckles that were a little buckshot. And the only sport I was really allowed to play was baseball. I wasn't allowed to play football because my mother used to say I had a face that was, that was perfect. She said, your face, it, it's made for radio.
I wasn't allowed to play basketball. I, it's not that I wasn't allowed to play basketball. Nobody in my part of the world played basketball because in order to play basketball, you had to have a big old patch of concrete at your house where you could bounce the ball. Well, we didn't have that. We had a gravel driveway and a dirt driveway around our house. Kids in town played basketball. The only patch of concrete we had was that little, that little, uh, that little block thing that we, we had way out past the fence where the pump shed used to be a long time ago before the wind blew it away. And that thing was only eight foot by eight foot, so you, if you stood real carefully in the center of it and bounced the ball, you might could bounce it 10 or 12 times, but you couldn't move nowhere. So it was baseball. Baseball, what we played. And I wasn't very good at it. And the position that I normally played was called the right guard. People come up to me all the time. They say, I, I, I've never heard of a right guard in baseball. So that's because it was invented by my father, who was our coach. The right guard sits on the right end of the bench and guards the water cooler. <laughs> my cousin Ed Lee brought this package of red man chewing tobacco from the top drawer of his father's dresser, my uncle. He brought it in there and he holed up in the corner of the dugout. He opened it up and he said, look here, look here. I got some, some chewing tobacco. This is what all the Major League Baseball players use. Oh, the boys just looked at it. He opened it up, it smelled like raisins. Raisins, it was, a, it was a, a, an illicit odor. He said, you gotta get yourself a pinch. You use your three, your three digits. You use two fingers made like the peace sign and you use your thumb and you, you hold them upside down and you use them like, kind of like a, a pair of salad tongs. You dip them into that, that package and you get yourself a little pinch and you tuck it in your lip. Hey, Cousin Ed Lee said, don't swallow your spit, whatever you do. <laughs> well, because I was a red-headed, chubby child with buckshot freckles and a face made for radio, I had a lot more to prove than these other boys did. So I took me a big old pinch and then I took me another big old pinch. But Gary, Gary was not interested in chewing tobacco. Gary, you could see him, he was watching the game. He was only there to play baseball. And this is probably why I didn't like him. Couldn't stand him. Because he was a good athlete, he was everything I wasn't. My father loved watching Gary play baseball and he'd, he'd throw compliments out there to Gary saying, boy, good job, Gary, good job, buddy. And he'd encourage him. I, you don't get a whole lot of encouragement when you're the right guard. <laughs> so I started to kind of not like Gary. We all tucked this chewing tobacco in our lips. We, boys were spitting. And I was forgetting to swallow my spit. I, mean, I was forgetting not to swallow my spit. I was, I was swallowing it. It was kind of crickling down my back of my throat. And by the time it was my turn to get up to bat, I got up there to the batter's box. And I was so disoriented from, from, from this buzz that had developed in my head, it sounded like someone had flipped on mercury lights in my head. Just this bzzz, and I was a little bit dizzy. I stood in that batter's box with my butt facing the pitcher. <laughs> and I was facing the catcher. I was completely turned around and I was wobbling. The father came out, he said, what are you doing, boy? Stand up straight, come on. Father uh, helped me get my batting stance right. My bat was just kind of wobbling in the air, kind of, kind of moving around. I, I closed one eye and looked at the pitcher, like I was, like I was trying real hard to get him in focus. <laughs> and that pitcher threw a ball. It burned right past me, and I just kind of <laughs> giggled at him. Next thing I know, he threw another ball, and then another ball. Strike three. You are out. And my father said, "Come on, you got to swing." So on my way back to the, to the dugout, I tripped over my foot and I fell straight down onto the, onto the ground. And when I fell, I swallowed my chewing tobacco. <laughs> well, you don't want to swallow chewing tobacco because it will kill you. It will absolutely kill you. I laid there on the dugout, the right side of the dugout guarding the water cooler. And it was the worst day of my entire adolescent life. I could look up into the sky and see this bright light shining down and I could hear harp music. And I could hear the voice of the Lord saying, come on home, 
Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. It was the same game when Gary hit a grand slam. A grand slam. Nobody on the team had ever hit a grand slam before. Nobody. It was, it was, it was unheard of. The bases were loaded. Gary got right up to the plate. They burned one pitch by him. He squatted down a little bit more, crowded the plate. The second pitch, he swung back. He hit that ball. It was out of there and into the pine wood forest. We had to get a brand new ball. It took five seconds to, to, for Gary to get to first base. And then when he saw it was gone, he just trotted along the rest of the bases, trotted along ever so, ever so easily. I just could not stand him. And it made it worse when he hit a grand slam. My father came out and found Gary. He got him up and he hoisted him onto his shoulders and he marched him around the field and Gary was waving at people. I mean, you would have thought that he'd cured cancer. I thought, come on, come on. All he did was hit a grand slam. Anybody could do that if the circumstances are right. I mean, come on, I could do that. Of course, at the time I was only two seconds away from my own death. I mean, they were gonna find me laid out on that bench and have to bury me in a shallow grave. But Gary was the man of the hour, man of the hour. I just couldn't stand him, couldn't stand him. We went out to get ice cream that night. My father always took us out to Dairy Queen to get ice cream after games. And we sat on the tailgate of my father's truck. He told stories, because that's what he did. He was a storyteller. The boys would just hang on his every word. And I found myself just a little bit separated from the rest of the lot. I was watching him, thinking, thinking how much I could not stand this blonde-headed, blue-eyed kid with the natural athletic talent who was a lot like my father, who could please my father in a way that I never could because chubby, red-headed kids like me don't have a whole lot of talent. There's, there's not left, much left for us. I mean, my only talent was sarcasm. <laughs> and even that was hard to come by. I mean, I did have a few other talents, to be, to be fair. I could make some very interesting noises with my, with my armpits. <laughs> and, and, I could polish off a bag of Chili Trees Fritos in under four minutes. Uh, I could tell elaborate jokes, and I'd had a very successful career in the fourth grade as a poet. Uh, I'd written some of my best work on the bathroom wall in the boys' bathroom. <laughs> Those are my talents. They're not talents recognized by my father. My father recognized athleticism. He recognized, he recognized stamina, and he recognized tenacity when it came to competition. I was the kind of boy who liked to wake up at the crack of noon. I watched my father tell stories and these boys licked the ice cream cone and I felt so separate from the rest of the pack and I had a sour attitude. My father noticed this. He patted me on the back. He said, what crawled up your nose and died? Only he didn't say nose. <laughs> and so I admitted to him. I admitted to him how I felt about Gary. I told him. I said, I don't see what the big deal is about Gary. I don't see what the big deal is about that guy. I mean, all, he can do, all he did was rear back and hit a ball. My father didn't say nothing. He just licked his ice cream cone and looked at me. He just nodded his head. He didn't say nothing. Didn't say a word. Sometimes my father could say more without saying anything. He didn't answer me until the very next day. The very next day. And here's how he answered me. He came to pick me up from school early. Now, I'll never forget this because my father did not pick me up from school early. He, he didn't ever pick me up from school, period. I, I usually took the bus. But the page me in my classroom said, your daddy's here to pick you up. And so I got my things and I walked out to the front and I saw my father. He had his baseball hat on. I said, what are you doing here so early? He said, come on in, hop in. He kicked open the door, he patted the passenger seat. Come on in, come on in. I said, I, I don't understand what you're doing. He said, we got a game to play tonight. I said, I'm not on the team anymore. I don't want to play. He said, oh, you hush yourself now. You hush yourself. 
You get in here. We got a very important member of our team to pick up, and I want you to be with me. I said, I'm just going to take the bus. You just go on. I'm going to take the bus. He said, like heck you will. Only he didn't say heck. <laughs> so I got in his truck. We drove along. I drove through the town until we got past the town into the rural parts. And he kept on driving. He was eating sunflower seeds. Radio was playing. I think it was a, I think it was a song by John Connolly called Rose Colored Glasses. Rolling along, the sunlight the light was shining through the windshield, hit me on the thighs. My father got to a run-down section of a rural part where the trailer homes were dilapidated and covered in rust. And we got to this home, it was standing in the distance, and it was leaning sideways. The sideboards were covered in a green funk mold, a green funk mold, and there was tall grass around the house. It looked like it housed the population of the county of snakes. I hate snakes. I hate them. He parked and turned the car off. He said, you come up with me to the door. We're going to get your teammate, Gary. We walked through this little zigzag trail up to that little house. I could hear the crickets and the yellow flies and the mosquitoes. And I looked out for snakes. We got to this little crooked set of steps on a homemade porch that was just leaning a little bit to the left and we stood there. My father removed his hat and he rapped on the door. And soon the door opened and there was a big tall man, big tall man with disheveled hair and an unshaven face with two little blue eyes that bore right into my daddy and he had a stained undershirt on and he smelled like a distillery. He said, what do you want? My father poked out his hand, gregarious man that he was. He said, I'm here to get Gary for tonight's game. Is Gary ready? Oh, my father, he could have been a politician, that man. And that man looked at my father. He said, Gary, huh? He looked up. I could see Gary leaning over this staircase. And that man said, Gary, yeah, get on down here. Gary came running down the steps, already wearing his glove and his uniform and his ball cap. He was eager. He came on out to that porch. My father said, I'll try to have him home just as early as, as, you can, as I can. That man just laughed, kind of snarled at my daddy. He said, I don't care what time you have him at home. Keep him for all I care. And if he gets out of line, you tell me. And I'll give you permission to whip him. And Gary just stood there, kind of his shoulders were slumped. We went to my father's truck. We rode to that game. We won the game that night. Never forget it. Won the game. It was the third inning, and Gary hit a triple. Three runs uh, were scored. It was just shy of a, of a daggum grand slam. Never forget it. Had to give it to him. He trotted the bases, and I watched him. He valued the game more than we did. He valued the game a lot more than we did. My father took his hat off and he threw it on the ground and he said, yippee, yippee, and a few other colorful words that I will not mention here in this place tonight. <laughs> and when it was done, my father took us to Dairy Queen, the whole team, and he got us ice cream. Gary sat on the tailgate of the truck and Gary didn't need ice cream that night. My father got Gary a big old foot-long hot dog covered in chili. Gary ate that hot dog so daggum fast that it disappeared before we had even taken three licks of our ice cream. And so my father walked right up to the counter and he got Gary a hamburger. A hamburger with an order of fries and a Coca-Cola. And Gary ate that hamburger faster than anything you've ever seen and he inhaled the french fries and he slurped down that Coca-Cola and I sat next to him, and I felt just as low as you ever, as you could ever feel. I said, Gary, I want, to know, I want you to know something. I'm really sorry that I acted like a jerk to you for these past, I don't know, however long. He said, that's all right. That's all right. I, you know, every, emotions run high in baseball games. I said, no, that ain't it. That ain't it. I'm jealous of you. 
because you're just such a good athlete. He said, well, you know, that's funny. I'm kind of jealous of you. I said, me? He said, oh, you got your, your daddy's awesome. He's a, he's a cool guy. Oh, he's taught me so much about baseball. Oh, I wish my daddy was like that. Yeah. We drove him home that night, my father and I. Rode in the front seat of my father's white work truck in a bench seat, all, all squished together. Our, our legs was all touching. We got to Gary's house there at the edge of town. It was so dark, you could see a billion stars up above us. And Gary just looked like he didn't want to go inside. I could just see it. He was just kind of, kind of sitting there looking out the windshield at his dilapidated house in the distance. My father didn't rush him, he just kinda shut off the engine. You hear that little music going, them steel guitars and twin fiddles and that music that my father used to love. Gary said, well, I guess I better go. My father said, hey, I'm so proud of you, Gary. You did such a good job. And I said, yeah, I'm so proud of you, Gary. You did a good job. Gary's lower lip just started to kind of move. And he said, thanks for the food tonight. And, and thanks for everything you do for me and, and for coming and getting me and picking me up and for teaching me so much about baseball. And then he surprised me. He threw his arms around me and he hugged me and said, I just love you both so much. I don't know what to do. So I put my arms around him. Oh, we just had each other there. Two boys who don't normally do this sort of thing. And then he let go. And he walked up his little little overgrown grass pathway to his house. He waved one more time to us and he opened the door. And he shut the door. My father just looked at me in the night. Crickets were going. Yellow flies were out. Skeeters were going. I'm sure the snakes were all out too. <laughs> My father held up his right hand, flat like this, and he said, good game, Sean, good game. Hey, thanks very much for having me tonight. It's been a wonderful pleasure. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich. And man, it's been a bona fide pleasure, if I do say so myself. This episode was brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy. He once said the best way to cure idle hands is to build something. So keep your hands sharp with a Case Knife. And by Folklore Brewing Company, quite literally the best brew in Alabama. Look them up today at Folklore Brewing and Meadery. Com. The music you heard behind me today was Gary and Uma Peters, who are 14 and 11 years old, in case you were wondering. They became a duo in 2015 when their effort to compete in a band category at the Smithville Fiddler's Jamboree in Tennessee seemed doomed, because according to Uma, no adults want to play with us. Well, they sure showed everybody who doubted them. Their teacher suggested they enter as a pair. Three years later, they won two band categories. Gary swept every youth competition music category except banjo, which Uma won. They did it again in 2016. They've collected awards almost too many to count, and they were just interviewed by NPR this past week. Look them up online at GaryPetersMusic.com. G I R I. PetersMusic.com. Download their music today. You will not regret it. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit Sean of the South Show.com. And there you can find archived episodes dating back to our very first episode to this episode, which you just heard. And while you're there, I hope you take the time to drop me a line and tell me about your birthday announcements, wedding invitations, and potluck socials. And I do my best to read them over the air because I love to read that stuff over the air for my friends. And speaking of friends, friends, don't hate yourself. Try hating a little worse instead. Adiós.